Let's talk about project settings. The project settings dialog box is found under the file pull down menu. And inside here, we talked a little bit about this in an earlier video. These are settings that are saved on a per project basis. So anytime you open a Form Z project file, you should be aware that there could be a different set of project settings for everyone that you open. So the default data scale for a project is medium building, but you can change that to large, medium, small, or miniature. And each one of these that you choose might change some of the settings that you'll see in here. And it's worth paying attention to because you wanna make sure that you're drawing at the right scale. You'll notice that you also have the option to manually override these. So you could set your base unit to feet instead of inches if you're at medium building. You could also change it over to metric units and change it to centimeters, for example, if you wanted to. So you can definitely override these main categories. The other thing you can override is the numeric accuracy. So if I go back to imperial units and set it to inches, I might wanna set my accuracy to 1 32nd of an inch if I'm doing something rather precise, for example. You may also want to change your numeric display options depending on what you expect to see when you measure something, when you're drawing something, or when you are dimensioning something inside of Form Z. In addition to the numeric options, you can also modify the angle options for different accuracy and display. The next tab in the project settings dialog box is appearance, and this is where we set what the Form Z interface looks like. There are several presets in here, and you can create your own as well. So it's worth going through those and seeing what they look like. Maybe there's something in here that you prefer. And custom styles are just that. You can set any color of the interface elements to whatever you like. And you can also copy those from another preset and then tweak from there so that you're creating your own because you'll notice that the presets are all locked. It's also worth noting that at the time of this video recording on the Macintosh, there is a default UI for dark mode as well as light mode. I'm gonna show you right now what the light mode looks like, and I'm gonna show you how to modify that. So what you can do up here is go to your menu bar and you can go to your display settings and you can turn dark mode off. Now that will not update the interface immediately. You'll notice that all the palettes Everything is still in dark mode here, but if we quit out of Form Z and reopen it, it will now open up in light mode. I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So by restarting Form Z, we get the light mode interface, which is a lot more traditional when it comes to Form Z. And you'll notice that the modeling window still has its background color because that was set in the project settings under the default appearance. And so what you might want to do in that case is switch over to the Form Z Classic appearance, which gives us a white modeling window background, and that updates. I'm going to go ahead now and switch it back to dark mode. So the first thing I do is set the OS back to dark mode. Then I go ahead and quit out of Form Z, and I'll relaunch the application. And here we are back in dark mode. I'm going to go back into the Project Settings dialog, and we're going to move on to the next section. There are a couple options in here which are worth noting. First of all, show color and highlight picked. You'll notice that those same options show up in these three different tabs, lights, layers, and objects. We have show color and highlight picked. They act the same way in all three of these. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn those on just to show you how they work because I think it makes sense to have the same behavior everywhere for right now. And we'll notice with layers and objects in particular right now how this actually works. So when I select an object, you'll see that it is highlighted in the objects palette and it is highlighting the layer that it is on in the layers palette. So we can see that that is on layer one, 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 and that is on layer one, but each object is individually highlighted. You'll also notice that the color of the objects is reflected in the objects list. So what I'm gonna do now is move these objects onto respective layers over here in the layers palette. I'm gonna go ahead and change my tool to the set layer tool. And I'm gonna choose layer five. We'll see in the tool options here that active layer is selected. So I'm going to move this object to the active layer, layer four, layer three, and layer two. All right, now when I click on each one of these, you'll notice that it is also highlighting the layer that it is on. So we can see that these objects are showing their color and showing their layer. Now, one of the things that we said in there was to show color for layer. And you'll notice that in the layers palette, all the layer labels are white. 
Well, that's because the layer color has not been set. It has nothing to do with the objects themselves. So you'll notice the object colors are indicated in the objects palette, but the layer colors are not. So if I double click on a layer, I can actually set a material override for a layer. And so let's go ahead and just choose a color that I don't have selected up here, like this second color, material number two. And I'm gonna click OK. And you'll see now that object has been updated to layer number two and that color is referenced in the layers palette. Again, if I go back, change it to something maybe a little more visible, like this purple color here, go ahead and you'll notice that that object has been updated and the layer color itself has been updated as well. So that is what that is referring to in the project settings is the actual material setting for the layer itself for show color to actually work. Back to the lights palette, it works the same way if we have a color set for a light. So let's go ahead and create a new light. So I'm going to hit the plus button in the lights palette, double click on light number one, go in, set the color to something very obvious like red. Go ahead and close that, close out of here. You'll see now the name of the light actually refers to the color of the light as well. So that is what that setting is doing. A couple of other things that you can do in these tabs, again, which works very similarly across all three, is you can set the default name and a default group name for every one of these. The other option in the layers palette here is to paste on an active layer. If I check that, and you'll see here that when I click on this object, it is on layer three. If I make layer five active, and I go into the edit menu and choose cut or copy, I'll choose cut just to make sure that we're actually seeing this, and then I paste it, you'll see it puts it automatically on the active layer. So if that's the kind of behavior that you want to see, you wanna go ahead and set that checkbox to paste on active layer. Otherwise, it'll always paste the object back on the layer that you cut or copied it from. The next tab in the project settings dialog box is faceting schemes. And there are several schemes to choose from for low resolution to high resolution. And these have to do with the smooth modeling settings because when you go to render, it will need to tessellate those objects into polygons. And it also has to do with exporting geometry. So you might wanna play with these depending on the output that you're getting. If you're seeing faceting, you might wanna bump these up to a higher setting. And if you look in the user manual, it will go into more detail for all of these settings. The next tab is dimensions. Dimensions allow you to set up custom dimension styles. There is a default style in there and it has some very basic settings. But for example, if you wanted to create your own, so if the default settings are just too large, for example, we can set a different set here and change the font to something else. We could change the terminators to something more architectural, like a slash. We can change the size of those as well. Something like four inches. Let's go ahead and unlock these. And let's set that to two inches just to see what this looks like. And we'll go ahead and set the witness line offset to something smaller and the extension down to something smaller, like three inches. And let's go ahead and click OK. So what we're going to do is take a look at the default dimension style and then our new dimension style. By going under the text tools, I'm going to go under that flyout palette, click on linear dimension. We can see up here in the tool options, I can choose between the default style and style number one. And if I click on default style and then go ahead and do a dimension, go ahead and place those. We can see what that looks like. And then I'm going to click on that again and choose style one. And this time I'm just going to dimension one cube. We're gonna zoom in and take a look at those. So we can see the original with Helvetica. It's got open arrowheads at the end. If I look over at my new dimension style here and I deselect it, we can see it's using Avenir and it's using those ticks at the end. I may want to go back in there and update those settings a little bit more now that I know what it looks like. But when I do that, it will update all of the dimensions that are using that style in the project itself. So for example, here, my extension was really large. I'm going to go ahead and set that to four inches as well and click OK. And you'll see now that dimension style has been updated. I didn't need to individually update that dimension because it's looking at that style as a guide. What that means is you can also select a dimension that is a style that you wanna change. And I can go into the inspector, into parameters, and I can change the different style and it will update it on the fly. There's one more tab in the project settings dialog, and that is for project files themselves, where you can tell it to keep backups of files. 
You can also tell it to save your undo information in the file itself. So by default, when you close a file, all of your undos are lost because that is taking up extra memory and file storage size. So if you want to keep that information, you can. Just know that it comes at a cost. Same thing goes for ghosted tool operands and files. We'll cover what that means more in a later video, but sometimes when you do a significant operation to an object, it will keep a backup copy of that object itself in the file, and you can tell FormZ to keep those or not, and by default, it is set to keep those. One of the things that you can do to optimize your FormZ's file size is you can turn off keep textures where the texture maps themselves will not be saved inside the FormZ project file. Of course, you can turn that off. It does come with a warning, and so you want to make sure that's actually what you want. If those textures happen to be an uncompressed format like TIFF or PNG, you can change the compression type of those images as well to cut down on file size to JPEG compression. If you choose that option, just note that it will generate much smaller files, but there is an expense here of image quality because the JPEG format is a lossy format. You should definitely check out the user manual for all of the details regarding these settings. And that concludes our tour of the project settings dialog box. Thanks for watching, and if you'd like to get notified when new videos are released on this channel, click the subscribe button below and click the notification bell icon to get a notification when new videos are released. See you in the next one.